Well, welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar from the Open Group, uh, which as you can see is today being brought to us by Avolution Software. Uh, and we're lucky again to have uh, Dr. Tim O'Neill of Avolution uh, presenting to us today. Uh, before I hand over to Tim, I'd just like to uh, go over a few housekeeping uh, points to keep the event moving forward smoothly. Uh, firstly, and probably most importantly with regards to questions, uh, we would of course encourage you to submit questions. It's a great opportunity uh, to directly uh, communicate with Tim. If you'd like to uh, uh, submit a question, please can I ask you to write your question into the uh, QA text facility. If you do write a question in there, can I ask you to address it to all or all participants? That way everyone gets to see all the questions that are being submitted. Uh, and our plans are to try and answer as many questions at the end of Tim's presentation today. Uh, now, today's event is being fully recorded. So if for any reason you have to leave early, or if you do experience any local technical difficulties, and I know that sometimes audio can be problematical uh, at times, then everyone who's registered for today's event will get an email um, with the appropriate link where they can access that uh, recording, and that will be coming out tomorrow. So Tim, if you're ready, can I ask you to uh, start today's presentation? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that introduction, Simon. So yeah, welcome everybody. I can see there's a really large turnout. Um, so I've got some, obviously some slides to go through today. The topic being um, five quick wins that will give enterprise architecture an edge. So what I'm sort of wanting to do is, is just sort of share some experience that I've got over the last sort of 20 years of doing this that um, I've seen as, as very effective. Um, proves the value of what we do um, as enterprise architects and obviously um, helps us to be better received by the business. So um, God, I think we've got an hour, so we'll sort of see how we go for time. I mean, obviously I'm hoping there should be time at the end for questions as Simon alluded to. So type your questions in the Q&A facility. If we don't get through the questions that are there, um, I know that I can, um, Simon will forward them through to me and, and we can kind of um, respond to them directly offline. That's fine. So don't be shy. Um, okay, so just a quick word, who am I? Um, as Simon said, I'm Tim O'Neill. I've got about 20, 25 years experience in this field of enterprise architecture, working with large corporations, um, sort of Global 2000 as they're called. I've been working with the Open Group now for many years. Um, I've helped to, um, you know, I've contributed strongly to the um, TOGAF standard in the architecture forum and also the Archimate standard in the Archimate forum. Um, for many years I was the co-chair of the Tools Certification Committee, so I've got lots of experience there as well. Um, separate to my work with the Open Group though, I've been involved in many other um, academic pursuits, um, if I was to say that. So I certainly am a research fellow at the University of Technology in Sydney as well as working with Evolution. And as um, Simon mentioned, Evolution is a spin out um, from the University of Technology in Sydney. So I sort of had my, my seat in both camps, both you know, industry and in academia. Um, a quick on Evolution, the company. Um, so they're the ones that are producing a product called Abacus, which is one of the um, enterprise architecture tools on the market. Um, global reach, um, Evolution now has customers in well over 100 countries, um, over 2,000 companies, and many, indeed over 3,000, what we refer to as Abacus certified engineers. So there's a whole certification program um, that our users can go through. Um, offices all around the world. I'm based out of our London office here in the UK. Um, obviously. The company started in Australia with the University of Technology there, which is where I'm from originally, but, but as I said, I'm now based here in the UK. We work across all the verticals, um, so all the different industries, finance, consumer, government, all that sort of stuff. Have been doing so for 15 years, um, and we've had great growth, over 30% year on year. And of course, we don't do everything directly. We work with partners all around the world. Um, so we've got over 50 um, key partners that we work with in different countries everywhere. So today's topic, as you know, is about quick wins. Um, so I just wanted to draw your attention to some work that Gartner's done. Um, there's a URL down the bottom of this page here. It's what they call Peer Insights. The Peer Insights is an open forum, um, so any of you can access it. Um, you don't need to be a Gartner client to do so. 
Um, what it does, though, is it allows people to sort of basically give reviews. Um, so it's the um, you know a good, open, fair, albeit vetted by Gartner. So you know they certainly do um, go through and make sure it's not the the vendor submitting the review and things like that. Um, but it's a really good place to get some honest opinions on the different tools that are out there. One of the dimensions, they, they do ask people to sort of fill in a survey or a bit of a questionnaire. One of the dimensions that Gartner always talks about is what they call time to value. Essentially, it has some, several factors. Um, so there's you know, factors around you know, how quickly can the tool be deployed, how robust is the tool, all that sort of stuff. Um, and one of the metrics they have there is, is this chart that I'm showing, which talks about the deployment time by vendor. So I've, I've, I've obfuscated away the other vendors. And I didn't want to um, do anything like that and try and spruik any um, things like that. But you can see the second row there is the evolution row. And what it's talking about here, the blue bar is um, clients of ours that have been deployed in under three months. The green bar is then between three and six months. So what you can actually see here is our clients, and you can see the statistics there, 73% of them are deployed in under three months. So that's quite fast. Um, and indeed 93% in under six months, which is certainly the best on the market you can see there. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is I guess we know what we're talking about when it comes to getting some quick wins. Um, we, we seem like we're the best tool for getting it in the hands of the users and getting them being productive as quick as possible, certainly in excess of 90% um, within six months. But go on there, have a look, um, have a look at some of the other statistics that are there, see the other things that are of interest to you. I think you'll find some pretty good information. Simon has said actually obviously that these slides will be available, so so we'll send these slides tomorrow if you if you say you you know writing down that that URL there at the bottom. Okay, so let's get on to the meat of the presentation. So these five quick wins that we've seen give enterprise architecture an edge. The first one I'm going to call something is better than nothing. Okay, so the first quick win. Now I'm sure all of you recognise that as the Sydney Opera House in the harbour in, in Sydney Harbour. There, one of the most you know, beautiful buildings in the world. I'm not sure how many of you know the history of how that came to be, but what happened is essentially back in the 19, actually the late 1940s, and then through to the 1950s. The New South Wales government put out a competition to have um, an architect design um, an opera house um, that they believed would be a, you know, a world landmark. They had over 200 submissions from all around the world. One of the submissions was from a Danish architect named Jan Ertsen. Um, and the big trouble they had with it was obviously the submissions were all just you know, drawings and sketches and things like that. And they really struggled to understand his vision of what he was trying to communicate. Sydney, as you'd all know, is, is a harbour city. It's a pleasure harbour, so there's sailing and all that. What he was trying to obviously communicate was this: the shape of the building here was reflecting the sails of the boats that were on the harbour. He was really struggling to get his opinion across. And indeed, in the first review of submissions, it was rejected. But then there was another colleague who, who certainly said, look, I think you should give this guy a chance. And he jumped on a plane, um, brought a model with him, which is this model you see here, and presented it to the steering committee. And the man on the right there is actually the, the premier. And needless to say, he won the deal. So by building a model, he was able to convince people to do something that otherwise they never would have done. Okay? Now, with the caveat there, of course, that all models are wrong but some are useful. So you absolutely need to have something to be successful. And this model here, there's, in fact, there's, there's lots of differences if you look closely. There's certainly no trees ultimately around the Opera House. The sails are in a different configuration um, now with the actual built building. But a model is very useful. It helps people, in this case, build a building, which is obviously a landmark in the world. So something is certainly better than nothing. If we put that into the context of what we do as enterprise architects, what we're basically looking at here is, you know, traditionally people are using the, you know, the Microsoft Visio PowerPoint Excel way of doing things, and it really doesn't cut it. We all know that. You need to have some sort of central repository, some um, global you know, reference um, place for people to go. But don't necessarily reinvent the wheel. There's hundreds of frameworks or notations out there to choose from. Obviously, with um, the Open Group, there's the um, Open Group Architecture Fed, um, Framework, TOGAF, and Archimate there. So these are really good places to start. Um, 
but really you know, focus on this fact of not reinventing the wheel. And there's a number of hybrids that exist. We, we in evolution have made hybrids of you know, different frameworks and mashed them together into a, a whole that we know is cohesive. And indeed, if you look at some of the research from Gartner here in what they call the critical capability analysis, they've rated Abacus, which is that first column there on the right here. This is the, the Abacus ratings as having, as you can see here, the best repository or meta model on the market. It's indeed the only one that scored 4.0 in any of the categories. So certainly the repository we have in Abacus off um, day one, out of the box, is a very mature um, starting place and gives you something very quick without you having to reinvent the wheel. The other aspect, of course, is leveraging standards like TOGAF, like Archimate. So again, Abacus has very good support for that because you don't want to have to roll your own. You want to leverage the experience of all of your colleagues who've been you know, putting all this work into things like TOGAF and Archimate. So certainly, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, use things that already exist and start with something. Why? because that gives you a single source of truth. We've all heard that phrase before, and it absolutely gives you something very quickly. So it's the fastest way to getting, as you know, Gartner talk about this time to value, a mature repository that's got lots of framework support and gets you something that is accurate very quickly. And I'm sure we've all seen a few good men. You know, that's the challenge. You know, can the rest of your business handle the truth? That's always the challenge with this, is when you're forcing people to commit things to paper, or in this case to a repository, you're forcing people and challenging the way they see things. You know, are there 500 applications? Are there 400 applications? What is an application altogether? Is that Excel spreadsheet we use, is that an application? So all of those questions need to be worked through to come to a source of truth that people can trust. But absolutely, something is better than nothing, even if it's wrong, it's still useful. Okay, if we move on to the second quick win that we've identified, I'm sure most of you recognize that. I, I hope you do. It's, it's Australia's platypus. Um, the idea here is you need to adapt or you will die. Um, basically, um, the metaphor here with the, the platypus, hundreds of years ago, 200 years ago, when, when explorers were bringing back specimens of the platypus, People thought it was a hoax. You know, people didn't believe it. They thought there's no way something exists that has you know, a, a bill and webbed feet like a duck, a body like a, um, an otter, a tail like a beaver. You know, there was just no way this thing was, was real. They, they were quite sure it had been you know, Frankenstein together. Absolutely, of course, we Why was there such an animal like this? So the platypus developed in obviously an isolated environment in Australia and it adapted perfectly to its environment. Some of the facts that you may or may not know about the platypus, that actual bill, so this duck bill of it, it actually has electrosensitivity to it. Um, the width of the bill, so it uses the electrosensitivity in its bill to detect the muscle contractions in the prey that it's searching for. Having a width to that, enables the platypus to triangulate very accurately to where the prey is. Who would have thought? It is an egg-laying mammal. So it's one of only two um, egg-laying mammals in the world, the other one being the echidna, again in Australia. And not surprisingly, for a mammal that lives in the water, um, if you give birth to live young, they're in a bit of trouble. They're going to drown. So not surprisingly, it developed a technique to lay eggs and then obviously get those eggs onto the shore where they could then hatch in safety. Surprisingly, it has poisonous spurs. It's one of the most deadly creatures in Australia. I'm sure you guys hear about all the snakes and the spiders, but absolutely the platypus is one of the most deadly animals in Australia. With its, it's got these poisonous spurs on its back feet, so don't go picking one up if you find one. And it doesn't even have a stomach. It's evolved to be so efficient, its whole digestive system and the, um, the diet that it has is so finely tuned now that it doesn't even have a stomach. It doesn't require one to process what it eats. So a very impressive animal. I hope you all have new respect for the platypus. But the fundamental message here is you need to adapt or you're going to fail. So in our context, of course, customer trends change, goalposts move. The customer is always right. You know, we have to take that opinion. Not your favorite framework as much as I, you know, I'm, I'm you know, very passionate about TOGAF and Archimate. They may not be appropriate for your client. If you're working with a, you know, let's say a DODAF client, you know, it's, 
it's going to want to use Dodaf. Okay, so the framework's not always right. Okay, the customer is, and there are hundreds to choose from. So certainly don't push a framework down somebody's throat. From a technical point of view, um, I can state here that Abacus is the only EA tool with a graph database backend. Okay, so technically, Abacus is, has the most configurable repository on the market. It lets you configure things on the fly. You can make hybrid frameworks very quickly. You can add an unlimited number of properties. You're not having to choose in a relational database a different table depending on which type of application you want because it's been pre-configured with a certain set of properties. You know, you absolutely configure these things or use existing hybrids and mash them together. And you can build dynamic queries on the fly to query the data sets that you have. So a graph database approach is fundamental to empowering an adaptable way of thinking. Okay. Now I've got a little quick question for you here. I'm not going to ask you to throw it into the into the chat window or the Q and A, but obviously I'll, I'll let you have a little think there. Who's that? I don't know if any of you recognise it. Um, I think you will now, Jeff Bezos. Okay. If I did a photo where he didn't have his hair, you would have all recognised him. So this was certainly the last photo I found that he still had his hair. It's from his high school yearbook. We all know Jeff Bezos as the man who started Amazon. You know, 25 years ago now, 20 years ago. Okay, imagine this scenario. It's 2005, okay, you're the you know, lead enterprise architect or chief architect within Amazon. You're a book company back then, right? Jeff Bezos walks into your office and says, I got a great idea. I think we should be the leading cloud infrastructure provider within 10 years. What do you think you would have said? You know, would you have just looked at him and gone, you're crazy? Well, we all know how that ended up. Amazon now has Amazon Web Services. And I'm sure you're all aware that it's a $7 billion a year business now. They make more money from Amazon Web Services than they do from selling books now. So when a CIO, CEO walks into your office and says, I want us to pivot, what do we say? What do we say as architects? Are we adaptable? Are we willing to go with it? Or unfortunately, are we the no police? You know, do we say no? Obviously, you can't do that. You have to become a trusted advisor. You have to be willing to examine any scenario that comes across your desk. And if you are willing to do that, I can assure you, you will deliver results faster because you're not going to be a blockage in the system. And I guarantee you, whatever framework you choose is going to be wrong. <laughs> it's not going to be 100% fit for purpose and it probably won't even be 50%. So you certainly have to be adaptable. And if you don't do that, you're not going to get to a successful place very quickly. Okay, if we move on to now the third of the quick wins. Okay, you need to analyze, but don't overanalyze. Okay, you know, this is you know, Sigmund Freud here and his psychologist couch. Be very careful not to go down a rabbit warren or a black hole doing too much analysis. Okay, you absolutely have to always be pragmatic about how you give your advice, what ways you try to answer the questions that are put in front of you. Don't be afraid though. There are simple equational and structural approaches that can be done very easily. You certainly don't have to, here in the UK people talk about boiling the ocean. You, know, you don't have to do a very thorough and very complete analysis piece for it to be worthwhile. Remember that original statement we said, all models are useful, sorry, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay? It doesn't matter how accurate your um, analysis is in the first instance, you need to just give something and then refine that, be iterative about that. Okay? Choose the low hanging fruit, all those different approaches that we know. But absolutely you have to do analysis if you want to get some quick wins. It is possible to do cloud readiness assessments, you know, health checks, um, you know, legacy modernization, all of these different things we do day in and day out. They're things that can be done relatively easily. You might be surprised by that. Can be done without much information and indeed can be done in a matter of days and weeks. Okay. Again, I'm not going to promise that it's a 99.99% you know, um, correct cost analysis, but it's certainly going to be something that's valuable and the business sees the point of what you're doing. Okay. So absolutely analyze, but don't overanalyze. Now, all the caveats. Be careful not to confuse precision with accuracy. These are some of the, the kind of the measurement or metrics, you know, mantras that you should become familiar with. I can give you the wrong answer to five decimal places. 
So be very careful, again, not to be too precise. Make sure you lead with all the disclaimers around confidence intervals and saying, look, this is only 80% accurate, 70% accurate. Okay, you're not professing that it's 99.9% you know, .9 accurate. You're looking for rough order of magnitude recommendations. But absolutely, you need to measure something, anything. Now, there's a, there's a concept here which is worth talking about because if we start looking to do measurements and start looking to um, obviously put some KPIs back to the business, the obvious question then is, well, which KPIs do we look for and where do we get the data for them? What we've got to be very careful of here is not to be um, susceptible to what's referred to as operational bias or basically what's known as the street light effect. So there's a, there's a little joke. Oh, indulge me for a second. I'll tell you the joke. So basically, a, a policeman sees a drunk guy searching for something under a street light and he asks what the drunk has lost. The drunk says, well, I've lost my keys. Okay, so they both start looking under the street light together. After a few minutes, the policeman um, says, look, are you sure you lost them here? And the drunk says, no, I lost them in the park. And the policeman says, well, why are we searching here? And the drunk says, well, this is where there's light. So be very careful not to just look where you know you can look. Absolutely, finding things in other areas that you didn't expect is some of the most valuable aspects to doing analytics. And absolutely, what you might be surprised to hear again is that we do a, not surprisingly, sorry, that we do an analysis ready maturity assessment for our customers um, at a three month time. You, you remember you heard that 60%, you 70% know, are deployed within three months and then 90% you know, within six. Well, at three months, we run what we do, a, what we call an analysis ready assessment, and typically they get a pass grade. So over 50% indeed ready to do a simulations and start getting some numbers, and that's within three months. So they're more or less getting that for free. You know, you get to pass and start doing all this analytics very quickly. All right, the fourth of the, the quick wins I want to share with you guys today is, is what we talk about as basically visualization. And we all like pie, I guess, is the, the subtitle to this. So some of you have probably read this already. I'm not sure how clearly it's presenting. So I'll, I'll read it out uh, in case you can't. So you've got Dilbert there, of course. It's, it's not a good presentation unless you have Dilbert. And he says, I didn't have anything useful to say, so I made this pie chart. And then your pointy head boss there is, ooh, and all his colleagues, ooh, ooh, it must be true because it's pie. And Dilbert's thinking to himself, well, that worked a bit too well. And they're all saying, I pledge my life and fortune to the pie. So absolutely, be careful. Pie charts are fantastic. They're a really good way of starting to have an engaged dialogue with the business. But absolutely, and there's a really good article here by Stephen Few, save the pies for dessert. Don't get too overdone with what you can do with a pie chart, okay? But start to think fundamentally about the other ways you might present work you're doing. Don't just draw lots of diagrams, okay? The humble pie chart absolutely has its place and allows you to make decisions. So pie charts, and we'll start to look at a few of the others, and different visualization techniques are fundamental to you being successful in the business and obviously being recognized as a value enabler than, than a cost center. We wrote some, we've done a lot of work around this. I'm, I'm sure you can, you can appreciate there's a URL down the bottom here for um, some articles and white papers and things about this, particularly giving some guidance about what sort of charts should you choose, you know, what sort of things, you know, what visualizations should you produce. So I'll leave you to, to go and browse that in your own time. But one of the headlines here is the, the statement I've put in here, which is, you know, while reporting is of course necessary, and often you'll have a regulatory requirement for that, the type of data usage that we know is needed to navigate the future landscapes and the future roadmaps ahead, it's never going to be printed out. Okay? These are immersive visualizations. They're interactive. They are, of course, dynamic. Okay? They're not going to be something that's you know, printed out into a report. Okay? Indeed, they might even be three-dimensional, and we'll look at those in a sec. This type of visualization, it's, it's called a chord diagram. Um, you might remember it as a cat's cradle kind of view that you used to do in your childhood. Um, what it basically is looking at is the interrelationships between things. Okay? So around the circumference of this circle, you've got a whole lot of different entities. It's, it's kind of, it doesn't really matter what the entities are. Um, they can be you know, applications, they could be goals and objectives, they can be projects. You know, really, it doesn't matter from, from the enterprise repository's point of view. But what you're looking at now are what relationships you might have with other things that you may or may not have known. 
okay? These relationships can be um, sized, so like the thickness of the connection can change depending on how strong and deep that relationship is, or indeed maybe how much, if this is a cost view, you know, you're looking at how much cost is attributed to somewhere else, you might use the thickness of the line to show how much cost is flowing in different directions around your business. Um, the direction um, is important. That could be, again, color here, red being in one direction, green in, a, in the opposite direction. But fundamentally, it's allowing you to more or less find, you, know, you often hear that you know, there's a ball of spaghetti or sorry, a ball of string or a you know, bowl of spaghetti is the kind of you know, the, the, the spaghetti architecture you hear about. There's different techniques um, called edge bundling. So there's various techniques you can use that will find the actual relationships between things rather than just staring at a, um, a very complicated you know, spaghetti, spaghetti view. So chord diagrams are absolutely one of the primary ways you should visualize things um, to start to get some understanding. Tree maps. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with tree maps. They're essentially a hierarchical boxes within boxes way of doing things. Some of the really good things about tree maps is from a, um, an efficiency point of view, they're a rectangle. And so they fit on your screen perfectly, regardless of you know, what your aspect ratio of your screen is, whether you're on your iPhone or whether you're on your tablet or on your desktop. Um, they're a rectangle, so there's no wasted white space. I mean, if you look at that chord diagram on the left, you know, the corners are wasted. You know, there's nothing really of value being shown there. Now, a, a tree map, has of course at least two other dimensions that you're showing here. So you're showing size of the boxes, okay? And that's trying to indicate something to give you, um, attract your attention. And of course, color. So like a large red box might mean something, okay? Now, to give you a kind of feeling of how powerful these might be, there's over a thousand boxes on that diagram there. A thousand. Now you can't see lots of them because they're very small and the designer of this view has decided that they're insignificant and not worthy of your attention, but they're still there. And when you zoom in, you can see them down the bottom right hand corner of each of those boxes. There's obviously hierarchy here. So we're showing two levels of hierarchy. Okay, so this might be an application landscape of a thousand applications. How much each application costs? You know, that might be the size of the box. And what our recommendation going forward is for that application in terms of whether we think we should retire it or not. Anyway, that's a really powerful view. The, the tree maps are a great way of seeing a lot of information and empowering people to start to make decisions. Okay, the last one I'm going to show you here is we talk about right at the start there that um, you know the decisions that we need to make rely on visualizations that are not going to be printed out. So Abacus allows you to do 3D visualization of systems. It's a fantastic thing to use. It you know, can be very fun and wake you up on an afternoon's day of flying through your enterprise. Um, but it starts to show you the amazing um, simplicity and elegance of your business, even if there are hundreds of thousands of entities. Okay, you're using information hiding, you're using you know, economies of scale to zoom in and see things that may or may not be of interest to you. And it's a fantastic way. You can, I can assure you, you can fit far more information in a three-dimensional view than you'll ever do in a two-dimensional view. Okay? You can, of course, color these and size these and do some fun things. To them. Now, you can't print them into a report, of course, so they're um, basically for investigative purposes. And you may ultimately then take any of these visualizations to produce a more traditional report that someone can then sign off on. So that still has its place. You know, your governance process of people signing off on things and those um, artifacts, as, as they're known in, in TOGAF, you know, the deliverables being produced um, from a repository absolutely has its place. But as an analyst and as an um, architect, you need to use things like this to be able to absolutely um, guide the business on what decisions they should make. Okay, brings me to my uh, fifth of the um, quick wins for architects and enterprise architects. Ready, steady, roadmap. Absolutely, road mapping is first and foremost what we should be thinking about as enterprise architects. You absolutely should be thinking about how quickly can I make a roadmap for a part of the business, for one of our you know, technology lines, for one of our geographies, anything like that. It's fundamental to how um, the business perceives us as enterprise architects and what we absolutely should be producing um, as architects. Now, again, I've, I've presented um, and, um, at open group webinars before and open group events before a lot about road mapping. It's a bit of my, um, you know, my bugbear. It's what I'm always on the pulpit you know, pitching, road map, road map, road map. 
we sort of decompose that into four types of roadmaps that you should always sort of look to try and produce, you know, one or more of those. Again, there's a URL at the bottom here that um, grab the slides, um, click, click the link. Go and have a read of this. There's some lots of treaties we've given of the different times and situations you may use one over the other, the advantages and disadvantages of each, and absolutely commentary about how quickly you can produce these things and how accurate they may be. Um, I haven't got time to, to go into all four of them again today, and needs to say I've done that before, and you can sit through those and those presentations from before. Um, but what it talks about is these four types. The first one is a, known as a tagging with recommendations and heat maps. Okay, that's one I'll look at a bit more, so, so I'll elaborate on that in a sec. The life cycle properties and Gantt charts, they're the ones you may be more familiar with where you're showing you know, the horizontal bars in a, what's called a Gantt chart, you know, like a project chart of you know, like life cycles of things. There's what's referred to as a ripple effect or a dynamic roadmap where you're looking at the interdependencies between things and how you know, putting a stop on a project is going to affect the delivery of some capability which then might you know, cascade its way through your organization and have ripple effects, you know, have a, a ripple effect of you know, making a simple decision somewhere and obviously what effect that may have, all the way through to what we pioneer as what we call multiple architectures. So this is having in TOGAF what's referred to as an architecture landscape. So you have multiple architectures in your repository. You have as is, to be, you have transition architectures, you have all these different things and they're all discrete things that you can do trade-off analysis and gap analysis and explore each of them independently and of course together to look at ultimately what is the, the roadmap or the course for your business um, going from you know, point A to point B. Again, I'm not going to go into those too much. I've done those in, in previous webinars and we can send you content and there's a URL there. I'll focus on this. Um, this first one, this tagging with recommendations and heat maps, because absolutely these are the sort of things you can produce and indeed we've had many clients produce these sort of things in a matter of days and weeks. Okay? I've given case study presentations on these things before. I can, I can give you these again. So Birmingham City Council there is an example I've presented on it's probably 10 years ago now where they did this stuff very quickly. Okay? So let's have a look at this type 1 roadmap. Right? All it really looks at is the what. So fundamentally, it's just looking at what is going to change, what is the future going to look like. Okay? It doesn't have much to say about when, it doesn't have much to say about who's going to do it, it doesn't say much about why, it doesn't say you know, many of the other dimensions that roadmaps can have and those other types of roadmaps do address. But it does make a statement of what the future is recommended to look like. Okay? There's numbers of methods here that you, you probably are familiar with. There's one that's called the four R's. It talks about retain, redesign, refresh, and retire. Okay, it's a you know, typical quadrant-based approach. The other one you may have heard of is TIME, which stands for Tolerate, Invest, Migrate, and Eliminate. There are essentially two different ways of categorizing the future state for things. Not necessarily applications, you know, maybe capabilities, maybe departments, you know, anything that you're looking at. But categorizing what your recommendation is for those things in the future. And that is absolutely a roadmap. Now you tend to present those one or two ways. You either present them using a heat map, okay, and there's lots of um, talk about how heat maps can be done, whether it's a capability map where you, you, know, you color a capability. Again, you might color a capability um, red to show that that capability is being retired or eliminated. You might color it orange or yellow to show it's being you know, refreshed, redesigned, or you know, migrated. And of course, you might leave it green if it's going to be tolerated or retained. Now, one of the critical things here as an enterprise architect is you can actually determine the future state recommendation for capabilities or any of the aspects of your business due to the relationships that aspect has with other parts of your business. So it shouldn't be too surprising that if you've made statements about your application roadmap or your application um, portfolio and you're saying that, hey, we're going to do tech refresh here and retire these and tolerate those things, again, you can aggregate those recommendations up to the capabilities that these applications support. Okay? So you're looking to very quickly leverage those sorts of analyses you do and absolutely now start to present them in some very simple views like a you know, colored capability map. The other one, which again, um, you know, we all worship the pie chart, well absolutely bubble charts are your stock and trade when you're starting out on doing road mapping before you even do a Gantt chart. 
Okay, A bubble chart is absolutely the first thing you should look to produce, whether it's again a business fit versus a technology fit dimension, whether it's value versus risk. TOGAF has guidance on this called a you know, business value assessment. They call it a matrix, but it's, it's a bubble chart. You know, just looking at at least two dimensions, you know, so the X versus Y, but then absolutely showing maybe the size of the project or the cost of the application or the risk in the, the radius of the bubbles and the color can again be the recommendation you're doing now about what you think you should do. Okay? So bubble charts, capability maps or heat maps, absolutely a stock and trade for doing these type one uh, roadmaps. Now, a couple of examples I've got time to show you. Again, these have been presented before. I can send you the case study documentation. We can send you the links to, uh, actually these ones weren't recorded, sorry, they were done, done in person at, at open group events in the past. But here's just a, you know, a, a very simple snapshot of some work that was done for London Underground almost 10 years ago now. Um, I won't go into the details of the project. Again, we can send you the case study behind this. But what you're looking at here are, in this case, applications. Okay, so each bubble represents an application. It is in only one business unit. Okay, so there were many business units, many thousands of applications, of course. Um, and what you're looking at, I'm sure you can read on the left axis there, is the value of the application was assessed. Okay, so the higher up the chart, the higher the value of the application. And then the, y, uh, the x axis is actually a priority. Okay, so in some ways that actually is a bit of a time dimension, like a when, because you know the higher priority. Um, applications, you would advocate and you would hope are ones that are getting addressed first, but we're not necessarily saying when, and we're not saying that we're going to do them in the next six months, and we're also not necessarily going to do them. This is just a recommendation from the architecture team. The colouring here is, you know, again, using the four R's uh, methodology. They indeed had seven R's, and I won't go into the seven of them. That's again in a presentation we've done before. But you can see the basics of it. You know, there's some red bubbles, which are you know, things that should be retired. Some green bubbles are things that should be, you know, this, this really strong green, are things that should be tolerated for now, but should be revisited sometime in the future. And then the, the kind of the lime green ones and other ones, they're things that should be being replaced. And orange ones are things that should be being renovated or refreshed. But absolutely, making a statement about the future of something as a bubble chart, again, this didn't take a lot of work. Um, it was given with all the caveats around how accurate um, this was, but it absolutely started to facilitate discussions with the business to make um, absolute decisions and engage and be seen to be delivering a value very quickly. Here's another one. Um, this is AXA, big insurance company. This, this was presented by a, um, a colleague of ours, um, by AXA themselves, at a, a Paris event um, a couple of years ago. So again, go and dig out the, the slides for this, but we help them do this work. And so again, absolutely, you're looking at, a, albeit in French, um, a very similar um, approach where you're looking at the kind of the strategic value as the, the vertical dimension there. So how valuable do we perceive this, um, in this case, again, applications to be versus across how adequate. So that was like a technical um, kind of adequacy measure. You might notice here that um, there's not too many that are being decommissioned. So that's the gray color, um, if you look at the legend there. This was mostly areas that were looking to either be being tolerated, which is what a white one is, um, being transformed, which is like repurposed or replatformed, which is green, versus being replaced. Okay, So rather than necessarily talking about shutting down and then never needing it in the future, we're saying that, no, 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 we still need these capabilities, so we're going to replace this with, as you can imagine, because of that vertical dimension, you can see it's the commodity ones. So some of the bespoke applications are going to be replaced with standard off-the-shelf ones. Okay, so there was obviously that mandate to try and go um, off-the-shelf rather than you know, roll your own. But absolutely, the same concept, uh, type one roadmap as we would call it. It's talking about the future, it's making recommendations, and it's produced incredibly quickly. And you know, we're talking in a matter of weeks here. Okay, this is not something that you should be delaying at all. And absolutely, if you go right back to the, the time to value statements that I made, you should be making these things within the first three to six months. There is no reason not to expect that. You know, don't don't start arguing about meta models and you know going down that dark hole. You know, you've got an adaptable tool, right? So just start with something and then let it grow over time. But get some things out of it very quickly. Okay, last slide. Uh, well, sorry, second last slide. Just to recap, um, the quick wins that we've gone through is absolutely something is better than nothing. Leverage best practice. You know, take meta models that already exist. Don't necessarily invent your own. Um, you know, use TOGA, use Archimate, you know, whatever your, your desires are. It's never going to be right. All models are wrong. Some are useful. 
So accept that you're going to A, adapt the way you do things, but also be adaptable yourself. You know, when Jeff Bezos walks into your office, don't say no. You know, you're, on, you're all in this together, right? You're part of the solution. Um, absolutely think about metrics. Metrics are a key to being successful. It, it opens up the communication in a language that business understands. You, know, you can talk about numbers. Don't get bogged down between you know, precision. You know, don't talk about you know, obviously 99.9% .9 um, confidence. Absolutely give rough order of magnitude. And, you know, and of course, beware of that, you know, the street-like effect. You know, don't tell the business what they're expecting to hear. <laughs> you know, it's great when you're a consultancy, but not so great when you're in-house EA team. Visualize. They're not going to understand if you put up some A0 plots of you know, using you know, some notation that you think is cool. Right? Give them pie charts. You know, give them bubble charts. Give them immersive ways they can understand. You know, make this an on-demand. You know, use the cloud you know, licenses, the portable licenses you've got on your tablets. You know, use those to write in the meeting right there and then show someone what you're talking about. You know, don't tell them I'll give you a report in six months. And absolutely think about producing roadmaps. It's the number one thing that you guys need to be focused on trying to make as quickly as you can for the business to see you as um, being valuable. All right, that's it. Um, there's some contact details, obviously, for the company and for myself personally. Um, drop me an email, of course, anytime. Um, I can obviously provide the slides. I mean, we'll have these slides available tomorrow. Um, so that's my. That's my 40 minutes. So it looks like I stuck to time pretty well to give us some time for questions. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I haven't been keeping track of them. But Simon, I guess back to you. You've got um, a whole list of questions, I suspect, have you to go through? We've got a few. Thanks to you, Tim. And just yep. let's reiterate, the, we have had a number of people asking for slides. How do you intend to make the slides available, Tim? Uh, oh, that's fine. I mean, we, we can send them out. If um, Simon, if you want to drop me, anyone who asks you, or if people want to contact me directly on that, that email address there, we'll send them out as a PDF. Um, I know that you're, you're recording this, so of course, um, I think you do that, don't you, Simon? You send out a link to the recording so you can Absolutely. share that with your colleagues. But yep, the slide's fine. Yep, yep, I can provide those to people as a PDF. Just drop me an email or, or drop um, Simon an email, of course. That's it. I'm more than happy to act as a go-between. So yes, uh, everyone will have my email address. Uh, being today's host, so if you'd like a copy of Tim's slides, feel free to send me an email and I'll liaise with uh, Tim and we'll make sure um, they're out. All right, so we do have a question in, uh, Tim. This is from, uh, and, and by the way, everyone, this is a great opportunity now uh, to submit your questions into the QA Tech facility. Uh, this question here is from uh, Colin, and he asks, how do you recommend it? How, how do you recommend eliciting the judgments on each dimension of analysis? And he says, for example, importance to the business. Yeah, okay. So um, say it again. I missed the start of that. So it's, the audio dropped out. So how do I recommend? So, sorry. The, yep, how right. do you recommend eliciting yep. the yep. judgments on each dimension of analysis? Yeah, great. So I missed that eliciting word. That's what I threw me. Um, yeah, look, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a great question. Um, and certainly when we go back and talk about um, doing analysis quickly, some of the... Um, I'm going to use the word research, but certainly some of the, the work that we've done in the past has been about there are techniques by which you can, I'll use the word elicit, it's a great, you know, when we talk about requirements and what we're talking about are non-functional requirements now, not functional requirements. Um, I can already throw a standard out there. There's an IEEE standard, 1061, 1061, so write that down. Um, I help write it. Um, basically, there are very formal processes out there by which you can help a business to determine what non-functional requirements they should be using. Each business is not the same. Okay, so if you're a fast-moving consumer goods company, time to market is a KPI that matters, you know, a lot more to you than if you're, let's say, a government department where you know, some quality or regulatory compliance may be more important. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you that there is a standard set of metrics that works for every company because fundamentally every company is different, and in some ways they all have different drivers. Um, there are 76 metrics. There you go. That's another, another piece of work we've done. So I can tell you there's 76 different types of metrics you can look to uh, measure for companies, and those metrics decompose into submetrics. Um, and obviously, there are, are some common ones and some popular ones. I can assure you that things like cost, you know, the financial metrics are common. Everyone has that. Um, speaking on behalf of Evolution and Abacus, we have out-of-the-box cost simulators. And remember, I talked about that maturity assessment analysis.
consider it cost model. Okay, So cost is certainly one, but there are techniques by which you can go and engage with the business and start to understand the KPIs they care about. Now, I'd also hope that that stuff has already been thought about a little bit. So normally when you look at business cases and you look at how companies make their already state what some of the KPIs are that need to be tested for any future state um, of the business. Now, of course, there's a return on investment one usually, but there'll often be some other KPIs. You know, there'll be statements about, you know, we are you know, going to the cloud or whatever, you know, and that's everything's going to the cloud. So guess what? The cloud readiness or the cloud compliance of something in the future is then one of the metrics you're going to need to be calculating because there's that stated objective as a non-functional requirement in already the decision making process. So go and get a hold of a business case in your company. You'll probably find there's a table somewhere at the start of it which rates different metrics or different factors or different KPIs, whatever it may be called, as a way to um, guide and, and instruct. Now, hopefully people don't game the system, of course, and make up the numbers, but needs to say it starts to help people form their opinion, or helps you as an architect form your opinion on uh, yeah, what metrics you need to start to calculate. Yeah, I hope that answers it. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, question from well, it's a question and a comment. I'm guessing from Shri Kent, uh, and he says, um, "Isn't it also important to adapt a twin-sided factor?" And he goes on to say, for example, customers also need uh, to adapt to the latest technology trends. I suppose we're depending on what we mean by the term customer there, Tim. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, sorry, what the what the the, the comments means. Um, I mean, you're obviously going back to the, you know, there was that statement I made, you know, the customer's always right kind of thing. Um, so look, without a doubt, I, I guess I, that was implicit in what I said, hopefully, in so much as um, the goalposts move. You know, you know, you wouldn't, you know, the Jeff Bezos example, right? You know, you think you're going perfectly well as a book company and then, you know, the, the, the CEO walks in with a bright idea of some pivot they want to do, right? So absolutely the customer, indeed, what that means, you know, if you're talking about the enterprise architect's customer, so the rest of the business, they need to, well, in, sorry, by default, you know, the only constant in life is change. You know, we all know those like one-liners. So absolutely, they are going to be changing. They're going to be changing their mind. They're going to be adapting as it is in terms of, um, what they're wanting to do as a business, and that's going to be coming. You know, that's going to be the demand side of things to us as architects, because we're going to be dealing with you know, you know, different ideas, different suggestions, different strategies, and having to reconcile those within the existing set and not being the no police. So that's one side of it. I think the other side is, I guess it's a fair comment that um, if we're going to be trying to show things like chord diagrams and tree maps and you know and, and three-dimensional views, you know, there's going to be some new things that we're going to be taking to the business as architects. Okay, that's a fact. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years, right? There is absolutely some adaptation that the business needs to take to learn how to make sense of the work that we're producing. Okay, yeah, we are at the vanguard of helping businesses make decisions, right? You know, you know we've been doing this for years. You know, we've got PhDs up the wazoo, right? We are the ones who are helping people, hopefully, see a new way of doing things. So, absolutely, the tail needs to wag the dog. The businesses needs to become receptive to this new way of seeing things. You know, not a big laborious, you know, forty-page you know, business case document. You know, you should be able to turn back these things very interactively with them, and they should be able to adapt. Um, to the sort of new style of information we're putting to them. Okay, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. And, um, I guess yeah, that's that's great, Tim. And I just there's a question here that I'd like to lead on from that because you mm -hmm. and this is from Mike, and he's saying, how do you get across the point that EA is planning and modelling and not engineering design that most IT folks want to jump into? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have a, star, a, a, a compelling answer to this because I, I agree it's, it's an age-old um, challenge we've had for you know 15, 20 years now. I've been fighting the battle. Um, you guys would know the books, you know EA as strategy by Eugenie and Ross from you know, MIT Sloan. Um, fundamentally, I I don't I'm going to be careful what I say here, but I think we have a problem in the fact that we even use the architecture word in enterprise architecture. Okay. I find that as soon as you use the word architecture word, you're tarred with an IT brush, and absolutely, you know, kind of anyone calls themselves, you know, Len Feskins from you know, HP coins the phrase, you know, I am what I do, architect. So everyone's an architect, right? You know, whatever they do. So what you tend to find is the technical architects, 
you know, they call themselves technical architects now, um, start to think that you know, that's enterprise architecture. Now, of course, it's just one domain, and strategy is one of the equally important domains with technology. So unfortunately, there's a bit of a, a branding issue there, um, using the word architecture, because you could pretty much replace the word architecture with strategy across everything. And you know, we're a bit guilty of it, like I say, in the open group. It's called the open group architecture framework, right? You know, you know, it's absolutely got the A word in it. Um, so yeah, we certainly spend a fair bit of our time trying not to use the architecture word. Um, there's a really good sort of so what uh, it's a technique, basically, you know, when you're trying to explain to someone like the, you know, the 30 second you know, pitch, um, where we actually don't even use the word um, architect or architecture. Okay? We'll often use the word structure instead of architecture, just because it positions things a bit neutrally in someone's mind. Okay, so that's something that yeah we all have to do together. You know, obviously it's it's a I don't know a marketing challenge that we all have. You know, we have to position ourselves right so that people start to see us in a certain light. And that also means, like I'm saying here with these quick wins, that doesn't mean producing a you know 200 diagrams for someone. You know, that that's you know not necessarily going to get your message across and not going to necessarily improve the perception of our profession. You know, starting to give people, at the same time, don't just give them pie charts either, they'll you know, probably underwhelm them too. But think about the way that we need to present ourselves as professionals that hopefully pulls us out of the, you know, the IT um, pigeonhole. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Tim. Um, Vanessa is asking, um, she says, I know you said you should keep to rough numbers, but how do you balance between over-analysis and losing your credibility? And she says, for example, she says that is, um, if the client doesn't believe your numbers, they won't believe anything else you say. No, uh, look, absolutely, and uh, look, a fantastic question, and absolutely, it's something I've been, um, dare I say, dealing with for you know, more than twenty years. Um, so look, credibility is everything. If you're going to be a trusted advisor, well, by definition, you're, you're hopefully credible. Um, so. First and foremost, you need to, whenever you have a conversation with someone about numbers, you know, you know all you know, ninety-five percent of statistics are made up on the spot, right? You know, all those one-liners. Um, you need to give some disclaimers, right? You need to start off by saying, look, with the amount, you know, this is the quality, time, cost trade-off. You know, the holy trinity of you know of anything, right? Quality versus time versus cost. You always preface what you do with saying, with the amount of time I've had, with the um, information I've been provided with the, dare I say, amount of money you've paid me <laughs> or the quality of the team that I've got, um, here is the quality of the recommendation I'm going to give to you. Right? So you give a disclaimer. and Hopefully that's not only 20% confident. Okay? Because if that's the answer, you're better to say nothing because you're exactly right. It could actually be wrong you know, then. Okay? So always have some sort of minimum bar by which you do start to engage with the business. Okay, so your disclaimer is still going to say, "Look, um, I'm not 90% sure of this. I'm not 80% sure of this. I'm only 70% sure of this." Okay, but it should be a pass mark. You remember we talked about this assessment ready thing we do. Absolutely, if if you know we've done a lot of work, we've been doing this 20 years, right? So we've built up confidence levels. We know, um, and we can do a maturity assessment that you know basically will tell how accurate is the recommendation going to be depending on the quality of the information coming in. Okay? And you'll be surprised how you may get, well I can tell you, you do get accurate recommendations, so you know, more than 50%, 60% accurate recommendations with a very small amount of information. Okay, so absolutely. You know, aside from you know, our liability insurance is you know, it's not necessarily so high that you're going to you know, bet your, your house on it. But absolutely, most of our clients do hand on their heart say, "Look, this is accurate enough for you to make a decision." Now, the decision may, of course, just be, "Okay, this is a pretty big decision, so we need to do a bit more work because I need that certainty to be 90% or 80%." So it becomes iterative, right? But you've now got the business in a discussion where you say, "Look, we think." You should do this, and we think you should with a 60% confidence level. And they go, okay. You know, now you're, you know, you're Amazon, and you're about to become you know, a cloud service provider. And he goes, all right. You got three months. Go and get 90% confidence. Right. So absolutely, it's opening up a dialogue, which is an interactive discussion, and you're not now um, you know a black hole where nothing comes out for six months. And hopefully, you've still got your credibility because, like I say, you've hopefully positioned your recommendation well enough that um, 
yeah, it's not completely wrong. <laughs> now, obviously, you want to sanity check things a little bit, road test it a little bit, you know, kind of get some glimpses along the way. Be very careful about the street light effect, you know, that observational bias, though. You know, don't, don't just tell them what they want to hear and, you know, don't look where you think that they think there's fires. Okay, so you do need to, you know, use some independence there. But absolutely, you should have a pretty good barometer of what the business is expecting and what they're going to believe you uh, when you say to them. Okay, but again, look, it's a great question. It's a philosophical question. It's one that, you know, whatever you want to say, you know, scientists have, you know, dealt with for, for thousands of years and we've had to try to do it in our context, but, you know, certainly 20. So it's a work in progress. Okay, Tim, that's great. Uh, we've got a couple of questions specifically about Abacus, so I'm just going to uh, join those two to get those together. Uh, I'll first off, start off with the first one from Victor. He's asking, does Abacus have possibilities to present relationships between capabilities and the IT systems for filling or automating those capabilities? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it certainly... Um, I can give the, you know, the one word answer, which is yes. Um, there's many frameworks, so many of those frameworks do do that directly. Um, so certainly things like um, we have a hybrid that you know, uses, that mashes together kind of TOGAF and BPMN and a few other standards. So those sort of ones do. Um, when you look at some standard frameworks like TOGAF, okay, they do have some hidden layers there. Okay, or you know, it, it's you know, in indirect relationships, so it goes via something else. Okay, but absolutely, there's you know, again, it um, depends which framework you choose. But we have, you know, dare I say, tens, if not hundreds, of frameworks. The Abacus framework, which is the one we we recommend to people where um, they're agnostic about what framework it is. We we don't charge anything for any of our frameworks. They're all freely available, so so that we've got no axe to grind. But the Abacus framework, which is our kind of embodiment of our best practices, um, yes, it has absolutely a direct relationship. I can tell you, it's called users, you know, a capability users um, an application, or a capability users a platform service, or a capability users um, you know a process. You know, there's a users relationship that we have there. That's great. And the second question on that is, and this is from Rick, is it possible to get started with EA using Abacus with just one person? Um, absolutely. Um, absolutely. We're, we're um, I don't know, what, what do I say about that? So in the simplest sense, I'd tell you, Rick, go to our website. You can download a trial right now and you could be using it, you know, in whatever, 20 minutes. <laughs> so, um, so certainly we support single Single people, um, no problem with that. All the way up to, you know, of course, we've got you know, deployments with hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Um, so that's fine. Yeah, we, it's a very you saw the time to value. It's very easy to deploy. Most of our most of our people are up and running straight away. You know, now that's of course you're you're working what we would refer to as a standalone mode. Okay, so you haven't had to deploy a server or anything like that. Even in the cloud, you can work standalone. Um, obviously, you can have on premise or or in the cloud. But yeah, absolutely, it's very easy to get up and running as a single person. No trouble. That's brilliant. Well, we've just got one more question here, and I think you may have touched on it, uh, Tim, but just this is from uh, Juan, just asking, uh, please comment on the analysis capabilities in Abacus, uh, for example, um, TOGAF EA model. Yeah, okay, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big question that I certainly we can't answer in a minute completely, but um, analysis obviously is a reasonably um, I don't know if I want to say ambiguous, but it means many things to many people. So, so analysis in the simplest sense might just mean essentially what people refer to as impact analysis. You're just looking for the structural dependencies that things have. Okay, so any framework has that. So if you if you choose something like TOGAF, just like we were talking about from the meta model point of view, you know, there's a content meta model in TOGAF, and it has you know 30 odd, 40 odd um, entity types with relationships between them. You can start to do what's referred to as impact analysis by saying, hey, I've got a capability here. What things are affected by that capability, which you know is obviously a relationship, and then you can cascade that relationship, and it's you know more or less like a degrees of separation way of understanding things. So that can be visualized. You know, you can have different you know tree ways of visualizing that, and you know other ways, and you sort of chord diagram already. So there's ways of understanding the impact analysis of making a change somewhere. Now that's very qualitative, right? So you're just sort of saying what's going to be impacted, and you know and all that sort of stuff. You're not doing anything that's necessarily a metrics based analysis okay now when you start stepping into the metrics based way of doing things TOGAF does have attributes in it okay there are certainly attributes in the TOGAF content meta model out of the box 
that lend themselves to you doing quantitative analysis. And we've got those already. So you can do different complexity analysis and cost analyses out of the box with TOGAF already because of the attributes that it has. Um, unfortunately, Archimate doesn't have any metrics out of the box, so any attributes out of the box, right? So the Archimate standard as it is, is much lighter on the analysis potential out of the box. We've been using Archimate for enough years that, of course, we've augmented the standard with lots of attributes that we know are beneficial to doing actual metrics-based analysis. So certainly there are you know, differing degrees. Again, we can, we can send you, there's a whole um, white paper we've got which talks about you know, all frameworks are not created equal, you know, and it absolutely talks about what things you can do with each framework, including how analysis-ready is each framework. So I can tell you that TOGAF is analysis-ready to some degree. Um, we've, of course, mashed frameworks together into what we call this abacus framework, which is analysis-ready for a whole slew of different approaches. Anyway, that's like I said, that's my one minute answer, two minute answer to that. And I think Simon, are we how are we doing for time? I know it's top of the hour. We're, we're just over, and I had said that Sorry. last question. Yeah, I'd like to end on this question because okay. I think with your experience, right. you may have something to partake here. I mean, Mohammed's asking, what is required to gain and keep client trust? Wow. That's not a one minute question, Simon. I'm gonna to have to that's that's a beer. That's over a beer conversation. Um look what's what's required to gain client trust? I mean it goes back to that other question about credibility. So you need to first and foremost produce something quickly. Okay. So you need to get something back to your stakeholders within three to six months. Okay, if you don't do that, they're already starting to be a bit suspicious about whether they're pouring money, you know, into a black hole. Okay. So first and foremost, you need to be responsive. So you need to get things back quickly within three to six months, which is why obviously I'm you know, putting these sort of slide decks together to hopefully help you guys you know, get, get messages back. Secondly, and absolutely back to that point about credibility, be careful what you get back to them within three to six months because you don't want to give them the wrong answer. You know, I can give you the wrong answer to five decimal places, right? So don't confuse precision with accuracy. So make sure whatever you're putting back to them is prefaced with disclaimers and is boxed in terms of, you know, this is only 70% accurate. You, know, you, you definitely do enough humility and say, look, I'm not dictating here. I'm not saying we have to do this. I'm just saying, look, the analysis I've done with the time I have is of this quality, okay? But help me to you know, obviously make it more accurate if this is an important um, decision for you. So fundamentally, being responsive, but then being interactive to increase your um, accuracy. There you go. That's my sober one minute answer to that one. That's, that's fine. That's brilliant, Tim. <laughs> Sorry, I'll set you up with that. Last that's right. <laughs> okay, well, as I said, this is a great time to end today's presentation. Once again, Tim, thank you for your time. Oh, uh, pleasure. Thank, you, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and please do join us again on our future webinar. So thanks a lot then, Tim. Great. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye.